Hello, I'm Mark Sawyer, a pediatric infectious disease specialist on the faculty of UC San Diego. For the past several years, our medical school has been working with public health departments to improve national immunization levels. One of the things we often hear from physicians is that they want to make sure they and their staff receive enough training in giving immunizations. This video is an answer to that need. Immunization experts from around the country have worked together to develop the video you are about to see. It deals exclusively with the skills and techniques needed for safe, effective, and caring injection of vaccines. It is intended for anyone who provides immunizations to children or adults. Hello, I'm Natalie Smith. Welcome to this video course on immunization skills and techniques. The video and the skills checklist can be used for training new employees during their orientation or probationary period. It can also be used for staff for performance improvement relating to immunizations and as a refresher for all other staff who administer vaccines. Ultimately, the medical director, doctor, or designated supervisor is responsible for the training and competency of staff. This video is only one tool. The content will be covered in three segments. First, we will present the basics of preparing and giving immunizations. Next, we will show demonstrations of proper technique on children and adults. And these demonstrations will serve as a visual reference point or benchmark for the standard of care in giving immunizations. It is critical that staff administering immunizations routinely receive training in safe injection practices. So we will conclude with a discussion of training and competency and how to review your own or your staff's performance in immunization on a regular basis. Our content is based on the national standards for immunization practices, the published recommendations of the ACIP, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. But it is augmented with best practices and tips from doctors, nurses, and medical assistants who give immunizations every day. We hope you find this video to be a valuable training tool for new staff as well as a refresher course for everyone in your practice who gives immunizations. For many healthcare workers, giving immunizations is an everyday routine. And whether we are administering five immunizations to a child or just one to an adult, as a healthcare professional, we want to do it right. We want to administer each immunization safely. We want to do it properly so the vaccine protects our patient. And today, when our patients could be scheduled for three, four, or five shots, more than ever before, we want to do it with empathy and caring. We believe the techniques demonstrated in this video are the most effective and least painful to the patient. They will help you make vaccine delivery as safe, effective, and comfortable as possible. If you are new to immunization, this video will provide you with the background knowledge you need before you receive your supervised, hands-on training. For others, we hope it gives some additional information to help you improve and maintain your skills and provide a visual reference point for ongoing self-assessment. Because we are covering just immunizations, not injections in general, we are limiting discussion to only the most common intramuscular and subcutaneous routes of administration and to those anatomic sites and needle sizes specifically appropriate for vaccines. We will not be discussing immune globulin, less routine vaccines, or TB skin tests. Why do we worry so much about the right anatomic site and the right length needle? Because the effectiveness or efficacy of the vaccine depends on using the proper site, the right needle, and the proper route. An intramuscular vaccine is intended for the muscle. The vaccine injected deep into muscle tissue is absorbed efficiently and gradually into the bloodstream. But when a vaccine that should go into the muscle is deposited in subcutaneous tissue instead, efficacy is compromised. The parents may think their child is protected. Your chart may show the child was immunized, but in reality, the patient has been left susceptible because the shot was given improperly. What a waste of expensive vaccine and with such potentially tragic consequences. Such errors can also cause unnecessary side effects for the patient, like painful local reactions. 
using the proper site, needle, and route also will diminish the pain often associated with injections. We administer most vaccines by the intramuscular route, including DTAP, hepatitis A and hepatitis B, Hib, influenza, and pneumococcal conjugate. Both IPV and pneumococcal polysaccharide can be given either by the IM or by the sub-Q route. We use anatomic sites that minimize the risk of local, neural, vascular, or tissue injury. The two muscles routinely used for intramuscular immunizations are the vastus lateralis and the deltoid, depending on the age and size of your patient. For infants and toddlers, the vastus lateralis and the anterolateral thigh is the preferred site for their intramuscular vaccines because of its lack of major nerves or blood vessels. Each patient is different, so before giving an IM injection, we need to expose the limb so we can evaluate where the muscle is and where the needle should enter. Each vastus lateralis easily can accommodate two IM injections. This site may be used for preschoolers as well as infants and toddlers. Providers who give immunizations regularly often get into a routine of injecting a particular vaccine, always in the same site and always in the same order. Here's what a vaccine site map for infants and toddlers might look like. As the site must be recorded on the patient's chart, always giving the hepatitis B vaccine in the left thigh, for instance, makes it easier to remember which vaccine was given where. Note that the buttock is not recommended for vaccines because the muscle there is thin and underneath it is a sciatic nerve. It should not be used for immunizations. For adults and school-age children, the deltoid is the preferred site for intramuscular vaccines. It is located approximately three fingers below the acromion, above the level of the armpit. Again, each patient is different, so we need to evaluate where the muscle is and where the needle should enter. Each deltoid can accommodate two IM injections. The deltoid also may be used in preschoolers if their deltoid muscle is well developed. The choice of needle depends on the volume and thickness of the fluid to be administered and on the amount of tissue to be penetrated. With vaccines, the volume of a dose is small, usually only a half cc. All the routinely recommended vaccines are suspensions, but comparatively thin fluids. These characteristics allow you to use a thinner 23 or 25 gauge needle. The higher the gauge, the thinner the needle. For intramuscular immunizations, a one inch or longer needle is needed to penetrate the subcutaneous tissue and deposit the vaccine into the muscle. Care must always be taken to ensure that vaccine is delivered deeply into the muscle. On a tiny infant or lean child, you could use a 7 8 inch needle, but this needle length is not in great demand and not commonly kept in stock. Use a one inch needle, even for a tiny infant. The more common 5 8 inch needle should not be used for intramuscular immunizations. Studies have shown a 5 8 inch needle is not long enough for an IM injection. For larger adults or obese adolescents, a longer 1 1⁄2 inch needle may be needed. If you touch the bone with the needle, simply pull back before depositing the vaccine. For IM injections, the syringe is held like a dart an inch away from the site and inserted quickly into the skin at a 90 degree angle. Now let's talk about subcutaneous immunizations. For sub-Q vaccines, we use a different site, a different needle, and a different angle because we are aiming for fatty tissue instead of muscle. MMR and varicella vaccines are administered by the subcutaneous route. Inactivated polio vaccine and the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine used more commonly in adults can be given either IM or sub-Q. The fatty tissue on the outer upper arm is the usual anatomic site for subcutaneous immunizations. For infants and toddlers, the fatty tissue on the outer thigh can be used instead. Subcutaneous tissue is just below the skin, so a 5 8 inch 25 gauge needle is long enough and is used routinely for patients of all ages. Pinch up a bit of subcutaneous tissue to avoid injecting into the muscle. For the subcutaneous route, you insert the needle at a 45 degree angle. Inject the vaccine and remove the needle smoothly. 
two sub-Q immunizations can be given in each arm. When you have questions about a particular vaccine, you can find most details in the manufacturer's package insert which comes with the vaccine. To sum up the basics we've covered, we've looked at anatomic sites, the vastus lateralis or deltoid for IM, and the outer upper arm or the fatty area of a child's thigh for sub-Q. We've also discussed needle size and seen the importance of needle length, a standard 1 inch or longer needle for intramuscular and a standard 5 8 inch for sub-Q. And finally, we've talked about the roots of administration, the 90 degree angle for IM and 45 degree for sub-Q, and what route you use for each vaccine. Probably the most frequently asked question about giving immunizations is about aspirating. In the past, we were taught that one had to aspirate to be sure the needle was not in a vein before injecting. Some providers aspirate on all injections and some never aspirate at all when giving immunizations. It takes a certain amount of dexterity to be able to do this with one hand, to do it quickly without moving the needle, and meanwhile continue to control the limb and hold the site with your other hand. More recently, experts have questioned if aspirating is needed. According to the AAP Red Book 2000 and other sources, there are no data to document the necessity when giving vaccines. The World Health Organization and other immunization experts believe aspirating may be unnecessary. WHO has made aspirating optional for immunizations in the deltoid or vastus lateralis. The new auto-disabled syringes being introduced around the world and needleless injection systems are not engineered to allow aspiration. Consequently, we leave it for the individual or the medical practice to decide if staff must aspirate. Now, let's focus on the proper procedures for drying up. After drying up, we will talk about healthcare worker safety when giving immunizations. Vaccines come in single dose or multi dose vials. Some are ready to use, while others need to be reconstituted. The first rule is to check that you have the vaccine ordered. Before drawing up, check the vial label against the order to make sure you have pulled the correct vaccine from the refrigerator or freezer and check the expiration date. Never give vaccine after the last day of the month it expires. Most vaccines come in single dose vials ready to draw up. Shake the vial vigorously and examine it for color, cloudiness, and suspension. Verify that the appearance matches the description in the manufacturer's package insert. If it does not look as it should, Mark the vial clearly, do not use. Put it back in proper storage until it can be returned to the manufacturer and take another vial. Select a disposable syringe and the proper length needle for the vaccine and route. The needle you are using for drawing up is the same needle you will use for the injection. There is no need to change the needle. You only need to change needles if the needle is damaged or contaminated during the drawing up process. Wipe the stopper of the vial with an alcohol prep. For a half cc dose, pull the barrel of the syringe back to the half cc mark. Uncap the needle. Tilt the vial down. Insert the needle into the center of the vial's rubber stopper. And then inject a half cc of air to equalize pressure. Now invert the vial and withdraw a half cc dose. If there are any air bubbles in the syringe, Tap it gently so the large bubbles move to the tip of the syringe and accurate measurement is ensured. Withdraw the needle. Recap the needle. At this point, the needle has not been used on a patient, so it can be recapped. If there are large air bubbles in the tip, expel them by tapping, but avoid squirting out any of the vaccine. If you are using a single dose vial, draw up the full amount. For multi-dose vials, this same syringe filling technique means accurate measurement and ensures that you get all the expected doses out of the vial. If you are using an IM vaccine supplied by the manufacturer in a pre-filled syringe, make sure you select a one inch or longer needle. For vaccines that need to be reconstituted, like MMR and varicella, use only the diluent supply. Reconstitute vaccines immediately prior to use. 
Don't allow live virus vaccines to sit out, warm up, or be exposed to light. Varicella vaccine must be used within 30 minutes after reconstitution. Remove the caps of the vaccine and the diluent and wipe the stopper with an alcohol prep. Insert the needle into the diluent vial and draw up all the diluent. Inject the diluent into the vaccine vial and agitate or rotate to ensure thorough mixing. Now observe the reconstituted vaccine. This one is MMR and should be a clear yellow liquid. Withdraw the entire contents into the syringe. As soon as you have drawn up a vaccine, recheck it against the doctor's order and vial. If you will be drawing up more than one syringe, Label the syringe so you will be able to tell which is which. You can use a colored sticker, a labeled silverware tray or placemat, or you can write on the syringe wrapper. Fill in the manufacturer's name, lot numbers, and other information for the drawn-up vaccines on the immunization record in the patient's chart. Now you are nearly ready to join the patient and administer the immunizations. Now let's talk about your safety. All of the syringes you see in this video are safety engineered Sharps devices. They have been designed and manufactured in recent years to protect healthcare workers from needle stick injuries. There are a number of different styles and brands on the market. There are also needle free systems now and as you probably have heard, researchers are even developing edible vaccines, skin patches and aerosols. But the needle injection will continue to be the most common method for some time. So you need to take precautions to avoid needle stick injuries after the needle has been used on the patient. Minimize handling of needles by putting the needle in the patient and into the disposal box without setting it down in between. And never recap a used needle. Sometimes, despite all your precautions, accidents can happen. Report any needle stick injury immediately to your supervisor so that it can be evaluated and officially documented and appropriate prophylactic action taken. Injections can mean coming into contact with blood, so follow universal precautions. Although gloves won't protect against needle stick injuries, many practices require gloving for immunization as a precaution. Other practices leave the decision to the personal preference of the healthcare worker. Gloves are only required when the healthcare worker has open hand lesions or will come into contact with potentially infectious body fluids. Both latex and latex free gloves are available to protect healthcare workers. Now that you are prepared, let's move on to our vaccine injection demonstrations. In the first demonstration, we will see and discuss the techniques and skills needed to administer vaccines to an infant. We will be showing both intramuscular and subcutaneous injections. This infant will be receiving four immunizations, DTAP, a combination Hib and Hepatitis B vaccine, IPV, and pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. The mother has already read the vaccine information sheets and the child has been screened for possible contraindications and precautions. Explain to the parent which vaccines will be given and where and show the mother how she can hold and comfort her baby during the process. The mother may be most comfortable holding her baby on her lap for immunizations. Hearing her voice can help reduce the baby's distress. When you are ready to go, study the overall size of the thigh and identify the site for needle insertion. Here she will begin with the DTAP in the left thigh, in the vastus lateralis muscle. She is using a 1 inch 25 gauge needle. Starting at the site, clean the area and the surrounding 2 inch radius with an alcohol prep and allow it to dry. Shake the syringe and then grasp it like a dart. Hold the needle about an inch away from the site. Using your non-dominant hand, compress or bunch the baby's muscle tissue between the fingers and quickly insert the needle perpendicular to the leg surface at a 90 degree angle. 
Inject the vaccine with steady pressure on the plunger. Never recap a needle that has been used on a patient or attempt to separate the needle and syringe. The second shot will be the combined Hib and Hepatitis B vaccine. She will administer it in the same muscle, but at least an inch away from the first shot. Apply pressure to the site with a dry cotton ball while mom comforts the baby. The pneumococcal conjugate vaccine is an intramuscular vaccine and she is giving it in the right thigh with a one inch needle. She has chosen to inject IPV vaccine subcutaneously in the fatty area of the right thigh, but the fatty area of the baby's upper arm could also be used. She is using a 5 8 inch, 25 gauge needle. IPV can be administered either subcutaneously or intramuscularly. After the final shot, let the family comfort their child for several minutes or encourage the mother to breastfeed her baby before they leave. Toddlers are much more challenging than infants. Not only do they cry louder, they kick, and they wiggle vigorously. While we watch a toddler get immunizations, we are going to talk a little bit about communication between you and the parent or patient. Rapport and communication with parents is an important part of the immunization process. As the person on the other end of the needle, you have an important role in reassuring parents and maintaining their confidence in the safety and value of childhood vaccines. Discuss the shots, return date, and aftercare instructions before the shots are given while you have the parents' full attention. Include the parents or guardians in the immunization process before, during, and after the shots. Watch now as the nurse involves the father in distracting and comforting his child. Behavioral interventions like using visual distractions help the child to cope. This toddler will be receiving five immunizations. DTAP, combined Hib and Hepatitis B, pneumococcal conjugate, MMR, and varicella. Federal law requires that health care providers give one-page information sheets known as vaccine information statements to parents or guardians prior to immunization to make them aware of the benefits and risks of immunization. Most practices provide these to the patients when they first arrive so that they have time to review the information and ask questions. These vaccine statements are written in clear, everyday language and are available in over 20 different languages. Next, she turns the child and gives the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine in the thigh. She administers the MMR and varicella immunizations last because both of them sting. She makes sure the child's arm is sufficiently restrained and administers them by the subcutaneous route at a 45 degree angle. After all the injections are given, allow the family to comfort their child. Remind them of aftercare instructions and give them recommendations for comfort measures at home. Make sure they have your practice's telephone number so the parents can call if their child has any reaction which concerns them. If parents have additional questions, provide them with references, with websites or books, or ask the doctor to speak with them. Because inaccurate and frightening information sometimes appears in the media or on websites, it's good to have a ready-made resource sheet you can give to parents who want to learn more. Kindergarten children, preteens, and adolescents are typical patients for immunizations, especially as school laws have changed to require a hepatitis B series and the varicella shot. As we watch the next demonstration, we will discuss how to work with school-aged children, as well as recording immunizations given in the patient's chart. Immunizations are almost a rite of passage for children starting school. By this age, all vaccines can be given in the upper arm. This child will be receiving DTAP, IPV, MMR, and varicella immunizations. The child can be seated, or depending on age and size, seated on the parent's lap, as you see here. DTAP and IPV will be given intramuscularly. Both of these will be given in the left deltoid, though at this age, the vastus lateralis also would have been appropriate. Then, MMR and varicella will be given subcutaneously in the right arm. Distraction methods and comforting are just as important with school-age patients. Injections are no picnic. By the time a child is four years old, he or she should be kept informed of what you are doing throughout the process. Ask the child to participate by blowing away the pain or repeating a word like ouch. 
Use of these pain management techniques makes the immunization process easier for the patient and the family. Relaxation and distraction can be useful to people of all ages and certainly should be used with children. As the immunization provider, you also need to be knowledgeable about proper documentation of the vaccines you administer. It is your responsibility to record all the information about each immunization you administered in the patient's chart. When you draw up, record the date, the vaccine lot number and manufacturer, your name and professional initials. You are also required by federal law to record the issue date of the vaccine information statement that the parents were given today and the date. After the shots, record the site you used, or if you filled in the sites beforehand, indicate any change in site that you made when you were with the patient. Anatomic sites are abbreviated as RT for right thigh, LT for left thigh, RD for right deltoid or upper arm, and LD for left deltoid or upper arm. Use a record that lists all the antigens on a single sheet, so it gives you the patient's immunization history at a glance. If you use a combination vaccine, fill in the information for each antigen. This chart record should be kept right in the front of the patient's chart so it can be reviewed on each visit. There is one important exception, thanks to computer technology and the Internet. Some practices already are participating in a local or state immunization registry. If you are, enter this same information into the computer-assisted medical record system. And always give the patient or parent a record of the immunization or update their existing parent-maintained record. Use the official state record supplied by your health department that clearly lists each of the vaccines by name. If parents have several records, condense them into one. Remind parents to bring it to every doctor visit. If a parent's record includes immunizations obtained elsewhere, Record them in your chart or computer so that you have the full immunization history for the patient in your records. And make sure to tell parents when they need to return for the next immunizations and write it on their record. In the next several days or weeks, if you get a call from a parent about a possible adverse reaction following an immunization visit, record this in the chart or computer record and report it to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. One of the great advantages of our national immunization system is that even potential reactions to vaccines are taken very seriously and investigated. VAERS reporting forms and information can be found in the Red Book and in the Physician Desk Reference and are available on the U.S. Food and Drug Administration website. In instances of serious injury or death, the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, which covers most childhood vaccines, may provide compensation. Parents can obtain information on the compensation program by calling the 800 number listed on the vaccine information statement. Even big kids and adults want to cry when they get shots. So make sure families know it's okay to let their daughters and their sons cry. Good. We've covered children. Who else needs immunizations? Adults with chronic diseases, healthcare workers, young adults, international travelers, and seniors need immunizations, and all of us will need a tetanus diphtheria booster. The roots, anatomic sites, and needles for adults are the same as for school-age children, except larger or obese patients will require a needle longer than one inch for intramuscular vaccines. Examine the arm to find where the deltoid is largest, approximately three fingers below the acromion and above the level of the armpit. This senior is getting a flu shot a TD booster, and pneumococcal pneumonia polysaccharide vaccine. Two of these shots will be intramuscular and one will be subcutaneous. She is giving the two intramuscular injections in different arms. She uses a 25 gauge one inch needle on this patient. Insert the needle quickly at a 90 degree angle. Pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine may be given either intramuscularly or subcutaneously. In this patient, it is being administered subcutaneously in the right arm with a 5 8 inch 25 gauge needle. Swab and pinch up subcutaneous tissue to be sure you are not reaching the muscle. Inject the needle at a 45 degree angle into the pinched up tissue. Although anaphylactic reactions to vaccines are extremely rare, every practice that provides immunization should have an anaphylactic response protocol and should replace their emergency epinephrine regularly before it outdates. 
and anyone giving immunizations should also keep their CPR certification current. In these demonstrations, we have modeled skills and techniques for safe, effective, and caring administration of vaccines. Our examples included an infant, a toddler, a four-year-old, and a senior. We have covered the anatomic sites, the proper needles, and the proper techniques for both intramuscular and subcutaneous vaccine injections. We also have seen that the immunization process involves more than just giving the injections. It includes establishing rapport, risk communication, comfort measures, healthcare worker safety, emergency protocols, and record keeping. This knowledge and these skills and techniques are the competencies needed by immunization providers. To maintain skills, healthcare professionals must regularly assess their own performance, as well as attend courses or updates for professional growth. A competency-based skills checklist like this is available for self-assessment. It also could be used by your supervisor or employer during your annual performance review. Let's talk briefly about how to use this video within a training program, either conducted one-on-one -on -one with a staff member or in a group setting. The video and the skills checklist can be used for training new employees during their orientation or probationary period. It can also be used for staff for performance improvement relating to immunizations and as a refresher for all other staff who administer vaccines. Ultimately, the medical director, doctor, or designated supervisor is responsible for the training and competency of staff. This video is only one tool. Competency in immunization administration is defined by both knowledge and skills. Proper immunization technique is an art as well as a skill. One can't become competent just by watching a video or listening to a lecture. The trainee needs a mentor or supervisor to model the procedures and to encourage their questions in a non-threatening atmosphere, then observe them as they practice. Trainees can practice the different routes using oranges or anatomical dolls until they have mastered the skills and are ready to immunize patients. It is important for the employer or teaching program to define the desired training competencies. First, the desired combination of knowledge, psychomotor skills, communication skills, and attitudes. And second, the standards used to measure the worker's independent performance, such as those included in the skills checklist we've shown here. As a healthcare provider yourself, you are committed to lifelong learning. Knowledge, skills, and techniques need to be updated and revitalized regularly. Practice sessions and staff meeting discussions also are essential, especially when you introduce or change to a different model of the new safety-engineered syringes or when you introduce a new vaccine. Mentor your staff and make their regular self-assessment and skills reviews part of the continuing quality assurance efforts in your practice. Patients want the person on the other end of the needle to be competent and the immunization to be painless. While we can't guarantee painless, we can promise our patients that we use safe, effective, and caring immunization techniques. Millions of immunizations are given every day. Each one must be given properly to be effective. This video has focused on administration for the most common vaccines, but it's not the whole story. Always refer to the vaccine package insert, office or clinic protocols, and vaccine storage and handling instructions. When in doubt, the immunization coordinator at your local health department is your best resource for immunization information.